Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast all about board and card games and the people who play them. This episode, number 14, is part of our classic series and was originally aired on August 31st, 2005. This episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games, makers of Battleground Fantasy Warfare, the miniature war game without miniatures. To learn more about Your Move Games or to take a flash demo of Battleground, please visit www.yourmovegames.com. And now, here's your host, Tom Vassell. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dice Tower. Uh, I've really been appreciating all the comments and concerns and just everything that people have been putting in the Board Game Geek Guild at, I mean, I'm sorry, the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com. If you've not been there before, I recommend that you check out our website at TheDiceTower.com and click on Forums, and it will take you right there. Lots of interesting conversations, and we're really glad to have everyone a part of our podcast also thought I might want to mention that if you're interested in donating and supporting our podcast, just click on the link on the front page of the Dice Tower, and we would really appreciate anyone who's willing to help us as we put out this show each week. Well, here we go. Another episode of the Dice Tower, episode 14. And at this point, we were still very proud that the episode was live quote-unquote live nowadays i would not even think i would be so enamored with such a thing because if we make some major goof-ups we stop all the time and go back and rewind and you might say well i'm always hearing mess ups i'm always hearing you just make some flubs well yeah thanks so much uh but <laughs> the ones that we take out are much worse and there came a point i don't remember what episode it was where I got started getting better at editing, and there were times I went out and edited some fairly controversial stuff that Joe would say just to be controversial. And then, so, and we still got emails about how controversial he was, and I thought, wow, if you only knew the stuff I cut out. But anyway, here we go into episode 14. Hope you enjoy. And I have to agree with myself. Thank you for the saying that, Tom. It sounds so good. You gotta get rid of the ending. That's kind of corny, I think. Yeah, little... you're probably right. This Sounds is Tom like Vassell. I'm Joe Stedman. And we're your hosts for the Dice Tower, a tabletop board game slash miniatures show, mostly about board games, mostly. where we talk about board games. Definitely talk about board games. This is our 14th show. I hope that we're starting to get a little bit more experience about what's going on. We've played fewer board games this week, mostly because Joe got sick over the weekend a little. Yeah, we just had a lot of responsibilities this week. Yeah, it's been a busy week. Now that school's back in session, our... Our freedom days are over, but I'm still getting a decent amount of games played. Yeah, with being teachers, we probably get a lot more gaming in than some people. That's probably true. And we don't have that long commute time that a lot of people listen to us on. So if you're riding a train, just think, we don't do that. It takes me four minutes to get to work. (laughs) It takes me 15 minutes. But but I ride a scooter. I ride a bike, so we're good. So we're we're glad that you're listening. Uh, For people who are new, uh, basically we're just going to talk about board games and war games. If you have any questions about it, anything you can always email us at uh, the dice tower at gmail.com you can check out our web page at www.thedicetower.com what we're going to start doing uh, from this week on out is if you email us a question or some comments we're going to post those on that site with the answers and or maybe we'll just let it sit there for everyone to see right right if you don't want us to do that mention it in your email and say i don't want this to be put on the website yeah as long as we get around to actually doing that work, the HTML and all that. Yeah, you know, I, it's like I need something else to put up on the Internet. Right. But, but uh, I just put up an interesting interview today with the Avalon Hill uh, lead developer, so go check that out if you get a chance. Are you are you uh, shilling your own interviews on our show? Well, yes, I am. <laughs> Don't you show your own blog? I do once in a while, but not, not nearly as much as you do. You're probably right. Speaking of... Reviews. We're going to start the show off with a couple reviews. And the first one is by Joe Stedman, Manly Man Gamer, about a war game that I've never played. <laughs> but I've seen it. You have seen it. Huh? That's that's pretty impressive, Tom, that you've actually seen it. Well, I remember asking you about... It just The title threw you off or something? Or what? No, 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 no. I understood it. I just remember thinking it didn't look like a, a, a very... Exciting game? Exciting game. How's that? You don't think that the uh, Seven Years' War is very exciting? 
I do. Go ahead and tell your review. <laughs> this week I'm going to do a, a short review on Quebec 1759. It's, uh, it's an older game. It was actually made out in 1972, so that was actually before I was born. Can you believe that, Tom? Uh, yeah. Because I'm 31, so that's a few years before me. But uh, Quebec 1759, uh, Columbia Games, it's a block game, and uh, it's, a, it's a good one. It's an often overlooked game. It's very easy. It takes less than an hour to play. Um, it's a great intro game for wargaming. It's two players, and it was made by the same guy who uh, Tom was it Tom Danglish. I I'd probably butcher his name, but he's the same guy who did East Front and uh, all the other Columbia block games. It seems, but uh, it's a game. It's the Seven Years' War, and it's a battle for Quebec. One player is the British, one player is the French, and you, uh, the, the British player is trying to capture Quebec, or actually the the Abraham Plains, which are right next to Quebec. And you take turns, and it's an interesting game because uh, you write your moves out, kind of like, like diplomacy, I guess, but you only do one move at a time, so it's not like you uh, have to pre-plan a whole bunch of things. So it's secret, and you reveal at the same time, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of fog of war here. And the British player has much more units, more powerful units. He controls the seas. Uh, and the French player, though, to, to battle that, the French player has a whole bunch of um, bogus or um, decoys, I guess, decoy blocks. I remember seeing that. Uh, that was an impressive th- feature to the game. Right, yeah, because I don't see very many games that, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of war games that have Fog of War, and Fog of War is a major part of battle, and uh, so it adds the Fog of War element, which I, I like that a lot. And so it's got all these decoys, and really the only way the French player can win, which I found out from experience, because usually the British player wins, at least in my maybe 10, 15 times I've played the game, only the only a really good French player is the high learning curve because the British player is just really, really powerful, and you have to really fool him and trick him to, uh, you have to like whittle him down slowly, trick him, and the British player only has 16 turns to, to make it happen, and so that's it. The combat is kind of once it gets to the combat, once the blocks are actually revealed and you're in the same he- the same square, it's not hexes or anything like that. It's like areas, but once you're in the same area, it's very much like. Uh, it reminded me of House Divided, where you, you stack up your forces a- across from each other on off the board, and you're trying to turn each other's flank. So you're trying to make one of the three columns. You, each, you put your forces in three columns, and you're trying to, to turn one of the other player's columns, and that's how you win the battle. It's a great game. Um, find it on eBay. You could probably trade someone for it because it's an old game, and uh, it's, I think it'd be worth it because it's a good... Like, how many times can you find a war game that's less than an hour long that you could... It's real, real easy. Like one page, two pages of rules. Uh, never, hardly ever. <laughs> there you go, Tom. My game is Go West. Uh, it's by Leo Calavini, made by Phalanx Games, also brought to America by Mayfair Games. Go West is one of the few games I played at Origins 2005 that I really did not like. I just found it kind of... Uh, I, I, I didn't like the way the game was set up. Uh, let me explain about the game a little bit. Basically, each player has a bunch of scoring tokens, and there's a bunch of wagons in America. There's six territories in America, and the wagons are moving from east to west, hence the name. Have the I played theme, this game? Uh, the theme matches the name. Yes, you did. Um, you're basically trying to move the wagons to the spots where you put your scoring tokens, and then you're trying to score the wagons. Oh. Now, here's my, problem. here's my problem with the game. I remember this. My problem with the game is that on your turn, you can do one action. Actually, you have a double action marker that lets you take two actions on your turn, but you, once you use it, you can't use it until everyone's used theirs. So you, you, you basically usually just have one action, and your action is playing a card. You, you either can play the card, and you pay some of your tokens to do the actions on the card, which are moving wagons, putting more scoring tokens on the board, or you can discard the card and take those amount of scoring tokens back from the box. That mechanic I liked. I like being able to buy a card or sell a card. It's neat. The more valuable cards get you more coins and cost you more coins. What I didn't like was you set yourself up to score, but then you can't score on the same turn. And then I will get you. Right. And then on your opponent's turn, he's not going to score for you if you're in a better position. So basically it's a game of chicken in the sense where you try and set yourself up to be in a second best place to score while your opponent while someone else, and you're hoping someone else scores and gets you some points. And then whenever the scores did happen, it would seem like everyone got a whole lot of points. Or not actually, everyone would get a few points, and one person might get a few more points than another person. Yeah. It just didn't give me any satisfaction. When you play a game, it's fun to move a piece 
and see the result. In Go West, you didn't see the result. And you could do, like I said, the double actions and the scoring cards. You had to pay to use them. It just, I don't know, it had a sense of drudgery about it. And with Leo Colvini's games, they're usually hit or miss with me. I, I did not like clans. I did not like um, Bridges over Shangri-La. But I did like Carlos Magnus and Cart- Cart- Cartagena. Is that or Cartagena? I don't know. The, I don't know. Whatever that game's called. I, I do like some of his games, but he's so very abstract. And Go West, the theme sounded good. The name sounded good. The game looked good. It just fell flat for me. So that's my negative review for the week, I guess. Wow, a negative review. Well, can't always be positive. But well, now we can be positive. But I was going to say, I forgot to mention about Quebec. I think the game's still in print. So, I mean, you can probably pick it up very easily. It's been been around for over 30 years. Oh, so. I'm glad Joe mentioned that because we got some people who sent us emails or posted things and said, you know that some of these games can be gotten here or there, and here's a good place for you to get the game. A lot of the games that we said should be reprinted, we actually own the games. We just think they should be reprinted for everyone's benefit. Right, right. We own. I think we own every game on the list. Well, no, there's a few I did not own. Oh, okay. But but I want it. Well, maybe between the two of us, I think we had all twenty. Probably. So we want them to re- reprint it, and other people said we get them from Germany. Well, yeah, but it's nice to have games printed in your own language. So that's uh, that's what we were talking did about. Did you ever get that movie game, The Triumph? Friend? Oh no, I don't. I don't have that one. Trump Fabric. That's the one we don't have. But we have the rest. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, so you, you said you picked up La Cid, all right? Right. Two weeks ago, we gave our top ten games from 2004. And we had a contest sponsored by Z-Man Games. And the prize for this contest was either uh, Primordial Soup or Santiago, your choice. Both very excellent games. Mm-hmm. And what people had to do was send in their top ten games. Joe wanted you to send in your top ten games that you thought were the top ten games. Right. And then the top ten games that you thought everyone else would pick. It's just like a mock em. Now, the top ten games that you picked, I'm still compiling those results, and we'll mention those next week. But I do have the results of the contest. It took me several hours to put them together, but basically it worked like this. For example, um, ASL starter kit, uh, advanced squad leader starter kit, ten people put that in their top ten list. So if you picked ASL starter kit, you got ten points. Woohoo! While two people picked seven ages. So if you picked seven ages, you got two, two points. points right? So, what do you think the top ten games were, Joe? What do I think they were? Right. These are the top ten games. If you pick these top you ten you, games, you, you never told me. One. You, you scum. You never told me. You're just putting me on the spot again. Well, I'm, I want you to guess. That's oh, all. okay. I, I ticket the ride. Okay, that was number one. Had fifty-two. It was worth fifty-two points. Um, Power Grid. That was worth forty-eight points. Goa. Goa was worth forty points. That was fourth. You missed number two. I missed number two. It's made huh? by Days of Wonder. Oh, Shadows Over Camelot. No, that's this year, 2005. Oh, oh, 2005. I already said uh, Ticket to Ride, didn't I? Yeah, it's not a simulation. Oh, Memoir 44. Memoir 44 was 50 <laughs> votes. That's a game, you know, that, anyway. Puerto Rico Small. Puerto Rico Small. San Juan. Oh, San game. Juan, yeah. That also be. 40 votes. Um, what else? Fantasy Flight War Game. Fantasy Flight War Game. Uh, War, War, War of the Ring. Right, 33 votes. Then the uh, IGA winner, St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, 28 I, votes. I didn't like that game. Heroescape, 26 votes. Ooh, I like the game. Reef Encounter, 25 votes. Ooh, I really like that game. Ingenious, tied with Struggle of the Empire, they both got 23 votes. Those were the top 10 games. And then following that was Carcassonne City at 20 votes, Maharaja, 19 votes, Blue Moon, and Events Squad Leader Starter Kit each had 10 votes. And then so I have piles and piles of games that had... Five, four, three, two, one votes. So you're telling me that no war games made the top ten? Sorry. No more did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on, war gamers. You need to be more pro- you need to send us some more email. That's how war gamers are. They they send the they send us the most questions, but they there's probably a lot less war gamers that listen to the show. Participation. Well we're gonna fix that in a minute. Would you I mean seriously, don't you think there's probably we get more questions from war gamers. We do. And, but we have more people listen who are not war gamers. I, That's I, true. I can almost guarantee it. Now, uh, what I did is I added your points together, and I, the order of your list mattered in case of a tie, which there was not in this, in this version. For people who came close in the last one, I gave you five extra points, which, well, we'll, we'll see if that helped you or not. You'll find out in a minute. Uh, I calculated all the scores, and then three people emailed me their list at the last second, so I had to recalculate everything. Oh. And so I did it change anything? I no, but it came really close. Wow! I triple checked 
the top five scores, which I'm about to read, so I know they're right. So we're going to do, like, the top five and then do the... We'll, right. We'll tell everybody the top five, and then we'll do a drum roll and say who won kind of thing. Oh, you want me to read them in order? No, just randomly tell me the top five people. Okay. Well, no, I have them written here, and, I mean, ri- just read them off this list in order. They're not written in order, per se. So these are the top five people who, who scored points. The, the highest score you could get was 365 points. The lowest score that we got was 97 points. <laughs> that was a person who put a whole bunch of war games. Yeah, that's probably me. <laughs> probably Gary so, Griffin's in her wall. Here are our top five people. We have Mark Haberman, John Bennett, Rich Pardo, Derek Jung, and Jonathan Nickel. Those are our top five. I'm sorry if your name's not there. I'm going to read each one of their scores. Uh, if you want to know what your score was, email me, and I'll tell you. I would have posted them all up on the Internet, but there was at least one or two people who didn't want their names up. So rather than wait, get permission afterwards and, or just have any hassles, I'll, I'll decline doing was, that uh, this turn. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. What was what, the average? I didn't figure that out. Uh, I, okay. The number five, do, 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 do. Mark Haberman with sorry, 343 Mark. points. You're the fourth place loser. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so close. Uh, fourth place with... And third place it was a tie. They tie both got 359 or? points. So did, did you break the tie? Did you do bother with a tiebreaker for them? I, I guess I, not, since I, they didn't win. I it, didn't. I'm sorry. Didn't, I, yeah. I can go back and look. Bragging rights, you know. Basically, what happens, is to get when they got this close, you put in one game and you didn't put in the other game. Um, so that those two people with 359 points are Jonathan Nickel and John Bennett. Wow. So that leaves uh, two people. Two pr- people. One of them got 363 points. And one got 365 points. Oh, two points. One of them picked. Um, what was what they picked? One of them. One of them didn't put Reef Encounter and did put Struggle of Empires. A two point uh, difference. See. It was close. So the number two person and who emailed me yesterday. Oh my goodness! Is is Derek Jung with 363 points, and our winner is Rich Pardo with 365 points. He picked the top ten games. So Rich Pardo wins. Rich Pardo, uh, we'll email you and let you know what you have to do to get your game. You have a choice between Santiago and uh, Primordial Soup. Congratulations. Congratulations. Woo! <laughs> All right. You know, we should get some Gol- applause. That was a golf clap. That, that, that's exactly where a sound clip works I'll do it in now. that situation. What's I don't have your name, scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Pardo. <laughs> okay, now we have promised you another game contest. Yes, and this time. And we are in. This time it's a real game. I mean, uh, <laughs> not that the Z-Man games aren't real games, but... Yeah, you but, can't uh, say that in the air, Joe. Yeah, uh, that's right. It's, this is a war game, though. These are two... There's two war games. Now, is it... Uh, did they get their choice, or did they get both? What was the They thing? get both of them. Both two-for-one deal here. And uh, it's from um, Worthington Games. I did a, a review of one of their games uh, a few shows back, quite a few jo- shows back. I did the review of uh, Rourke's Drift. Anyway, Worthington Games is uh, a board game company that is right out of Virginia Beach. It's kind of a father and son, or it's an uncle. It's uncle and uncle and nephew, I think. Right, I but they, they said people often confuse them as father and son. Grant Wiley and his uncle Mike Wiley. Anyway, they put out uh, Rourke's Drift, and now they've put out two new games. One is called uh, Clash of for the Continent, and the other is uh, For Honor and Glory. They have actually real long names. but <laughs> what is No, no, here they are. It's Clash for the Continent, Battles of the American Revolution and French and Indian War. That's the first game. And the okay. second game is for Honor and Glory, Land and Naval Battles of the War of 1812. I just call them Clash for the Continent and For Honor and Glory, so, you know. Well, so do they. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, anyway, so if you win this contest, you get both games. They're going to mail you both games. Now, these are very light. If, uh, they're very light games. If you listen to my review of, uh, of um, Rourke's Drift, you'll realize it's a game that even Eurogamers would like because it's not very rules-intensive and it's, it's only about an hour, hour and a half playtime. Actually, according to the, the uh, Board Game Geek, this For Honor and Glory one, is 30 minutes playing time. 30 minutes. Now, is this the If I remember right, this is the one that's very similar to uh, Battlecry. Is that correct? That is, I Have you played it? No. For Honor and Glory, I don't know about that one, but the other one is is the other one which is the Clash for the Continent. That one is mentioned as being close to Memoir 44. Well, there you Both go. Both of them have really high rankings on Board Game Geek, and they said that they started the company because they wanted to play games that were short and fairly simple. And not you know not take a lot of time something that I really like so I'm I'm actually interested in playing these I'm, yeah yeah I'll, I'll probably even write reviews of them yeah definitely I'll tell you what so so you get both games 
if you win this contest. And uh, I actually met these guys. I met I, I met the I met one of the two. I think it was probably the nephew because he was he was fairly he was younger. He was probably in his forties, thirties. And uh, we played at Origins two years ago. He he taught me Rourke's Drift, and that was what got me turned on to Worthington Games. I'm really excited that we got a war game company that was willing to uh, participate in this. I hope we can get some future war game companies. And if you're part of a war game company, please email us. Or we, any board game any, company. Any board game company. We'd love to uh, give away your games. <laughs> but, yeah, but we, we do appreciate them giving us away. Um, check out their website. It's at worthingtongames.com. You can read more about them there. And so I guess you want to know how you can win these great games. Tell them, Banna. <laughs> All right, this week we've uh, we've decided to make it a little more interesting. We're not going to be too complicated, no concept. Yeah, because I don't feel like doing four hours worth of statistics right. this week. So this time, all you have to do is mail us the first name of a person that, been, that has been mentioned on our show numerous times. But you have to be a regular listener, otherwise you might not know. Or you might have to go back and listen to some previous episodes. I, 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 well, we have to give them some clues, because we mentioned oh, a lot of people by well, first that's name. True. We have to give them clues, don't we? Well, I figured if I don't have anyone's names, then I can just win the games myself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, no, this, this, me and Tom, we refer to this guy as the snack daddy. That's, that's the only clue I want to give. Well, oh, I've also mentioned that he is one of the best opponents I've ever played in the game. The snack daddy. Yeah, so if you can find that in some show somewhere and tell us who it is, anyone who gets the right answer, we'll take all your names and we'll randomize and randomize one person and, will win. Yeah, so the odds are whoever knows the name. So it's not just you have to know the name. And all you got to do is just include the name and we'll enter you in. So it's the Snack Daddy. Oh, and we forgot to say, uh, you can only win one game uh, a year. So, Rich Pardo, I'm sorry, but you can't win this contest. But we still love to you hear your questions and stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should we give any more clues? I mean, that's, didn't we say before that we we're going to mention what he does for a we living? We said he was. Uh, oh yeah, we'll, we'll say okay. that. Okay, he's a he's a lieutenant colonel in the army. That that's that's a lot of information. And for he him. was here in Korea. He was in Korea, right? And so the snack daddy who's in the military who's no longer in Korea but used to be. There you go. All you do is give us his first name. Although if you give us his last name, we'll put your name in the pool twice. Oh yeah, because you know his last name. His hey. last name, I don't think we've ever said it. Maybe we have. Maybe once. But you can find him on the internet. No, I'm maybe. pretty sure I have it. Okay. Well, either way. A little research, you can figure it out. Yeah. So, but if you don't want free games, don't try. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All my bogus email accounts are going to start entering the contest any day now. This episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games. Your Move Games has recently launched the Battle for Hill 218, a fast-paced two-player card game with a retail price of just $10, coming soon to your friendly local game store. You can also download a free computer version of Hill 218 at www.yourmovegames.com and play against your PC. All right. Here's our questions, and like we said, half of them are for Joe again for the things. But we do thank you for your questions. As I said earlier in the show, we're going to be putting questions up on the Internet um, with answers eventually. It will, it will be a little easier for us, and it's a little a little simpler. In fact, Joe might post some on his blog every once in a while. Yeah, I'd love that, to. That's a faster way to do it. Yeah, the war fact, games. I think probably all the war game questions. The war game questions. That's just definitely. what Joe will do. And there'll it, probably be a link. We'll put a link over at the Dice Tower. If maybe. you have a comment about the show or you say something funny, like Dave Shapiro, he sent me a very lengthy uh, reasoning why he should get 11 extra points in this contest. <laughs> and it was so convincing um, that I actually gave him the 11 points, and he still managed to come in the bottom one-third. <laughs> Good so, job, Dave. Dave, I think you got just... Uh, 283 points, I think, but <laughs> good job anyway. That was with the 11 bonus points. Good job. I'm so. proud of you, Dave. I'm actually going to talk about you later, so just keep listening, Dave. We'll, All right. we'll redeem your name. Well, here's Joe's first question. Joe, it says, have your battles, have your games of Battle for Germany been using the SPI edition or the Decision Games edition? And if you played both, which do you like better and why? That question's from Jeff Meyer. You know, this is a question I get asked quite a bit. So I got asked this question so much that I went ahead and went to Board Game Geek and I posted on Board Game Geek in the uh, article section the differences between the two versions. Um, so if you go there and you look, you can see where the, under the articles, and I guess this is an advertisement for Board Game Geek here, but if you go to the articles... Nothing wrong with advertising them. They put cool little flags under our names. Yeah, I like the flags. I don't care what anybody says. For people who may be stumbling across this show and wondering what Board Game Geek is, the biggest site and the most filled site with all the board game information you ever want to know 
is BoardGameGeek.com. So check it out if you get a chance. No, it's, it's one of the biggest sites. It may not be my favorite site, but it's one of the best sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, the difference, I really prefer the SPI version. And uh, it's just, it's, maybe part of it is just a nostalgia thing. I just, it was the first one I played. It's the original one. Uh, Jim Dunnigan actually was uh, watching me play one time, talked to me about it. He's the designer of the game. Um, but the, G, the DG version, basically what they did was they... The, the Western Allies, so you're, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're familiar with the game, but in the DG version, the Decision Games version, with the Western Allies, they kind of upped the strengths of them. They, they, um, they gave the SS Panzer Corps a little bit more power, and they, they changed the Italian front, uh, made it into a big paratrooper unit. And so they basically gave the West Germans a, better, a little better chance. And then, but the real big difference is on the East Front. They added something called the Corlin Pocket, and it's a really weird thing. You put four German and two Soviet unit, uh, units in there, and the Soviet units can't leave until after all the Germans leave by sea, one per turn. So um, they all ride, they go to Stessen. Or, they, they end up on the board. But what a German will do then is they'll just leave one unit in there for as long as they can, kind of like a like a stop gate, and so the Russian can't get out. And I just don't really like it. Most agree that uh, most agree that these changes give the Russians even more of advantage and. On Consum World, there's this. Uh, it's weird because I subscribe to a bunch of different threads in Consum World, and I subscribe to the thread w- about this one game. And this every day, there's people posting about this one game. There's a debate going between a couple guys there right now, and uh, about who wins the game or who should always win the game. And I have my own opinions on that, but definitely go with the SBI version. But if you can get the DG version, it's cheap. You can probably get it for 17, 18 bucks. Pick it up. So that's about Battle for Germany. Uh, the next question was for both of us, and we'll just summarize it. Basically, it was from Ken Lee, and he wanted us to continue our discussion slightly. Someone asked us if we thought board games were art, and I said, nah, and Joe said, yes, yes, but not emphatically, yes or did No, I, I thought it pretty emphatically. Do you think art. all board games are art? I think all board games are not. I think some board games are trash. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good point. Uh, you can tell me that a Chia, a Chia game, uh, you know, that's my nickname for him, you know, well, you know, some 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 games I I would say, as soon as I see them, I thought art the the gift series. When well, you okay. see Zertz sitting on the table. Okay, now we're talking it's about such a pretty game. Well, I think there's a difference. I mean, that's like aesthetic art, you know, pleasing to the eye. But I mean, like just Battle for Germany, the game we just talked about, is a very simple game, but it's elegant. And to me, it's an art form because it's just so neat the way it, the whole game works out. It's just a very nice game. To me, it's art. I uh, guess I guess for me, the whole point is I just don't care. <laughs> if they're art or not, it doesn't matter for me. It's they're a game. It's because you're so cultured, Tom. You're just a real cultured guy. It's no, it's because I'm not cultured. <laughs> okay. But, uh, I've seen some war game maps. I just really like. I like to put them in a frame and put them on my wall. Man, uh, but I know my wife would probably veto that decision. Well, probably. Okay. This question is for. This question's for Joe, and it's from Ninja Bob. Ninja Bob. Ninja Bob. Ninja Bob. Ninja Bob. And you know why we're saying his name so many times? It's because Ninja Bob gave us the idea for the Kangaroos and Turkey segment. He said something to the effect of uh, that he. Um, it's just. Keep going, Tom. He said something to the effect of Joe's name was Joe and my name was Tom. So Tom is for Turkey and Joe is for Kangaroos. And so we took the Kangaroos and Turkeys and we do it every three or four shows or so. And we really appreciate uh, what he said for us. So. That's it. Ninja Bob, we thank you for the kangaroos and turkey segment. Now we've given him a shout-out. Here's his question for Joe. His question is, uh, would We the People be a good game for 10 to 11-year-olds to play as a class? Last year we played Battle Cry after finishing up our Civil War unit. Each student had a hex of soldiers um, that they controlled, and we had a blast. It was a great way to wrap up the unit. So I'm wondering if the We the People would be a good wrap-up game for a Revolutionary War unit. If not, what would you recommend? Go ahead. Oh, first of all, while We the People is one of my one of my favorite games, I highly doubt that it would be something that uh, uh, kids this age could play. I mean, you could do it, but you'd really have to mentor them. You'd really have to help them make their decisions. Uh, it's card-driven. Uh, there's a lot of strategy in the game. People get a bad rap to card-driven games and say that they're just over, overly simple, but in my opinion, in card-driven games, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made that are really hard. And so uh, I, wouldn't, I would say no. But, you know, I, was said, I said earlier that I was going to give Dave Shapiro uh, some knocks. Dave Shapiro put a game... He made a game. It's called the the Perfect Union. 
it's an election game. It's very it's just a game that simulates the election in 1776, the first elections there with the different colonies and whatnot. And uh, it's a very simple game. He put it out in Games Magazine a few years ago. Uh, I really like it. I have a copy of it. I'm looking at it right now. And I'm sure if you went through the old games magazines, you could find it. Or even maybe if you emailed Dave, he might have it. Uh, I know I have it. I'm not, you know. So it's called A Perfect Union. You should do some research and look that up. I think that that's my, rec- my recommendation right there. Okay. Um, and then the last question, I think, is for me. So that's a nice change always. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I had to give Joe the question because he. Gets, oh yes, yes. I, he I'm never sorry. gets to ask questions because they're always for him. I'm, I can't read very well. All right, here we go. Here's a question for Tom: When you review a Euro game, how much of your rating is based on mechanism versus fun factor? Question. Or uh, case in point: uh, In a game review, you mentioned that China might have made your top ten list. I'm, I'm assuming you saw a Chinatown, right? If only it were fun, but still rated at eight point five. How can a game that provides you no fun warrant such a high rating? What elements in a game can outweigh the fun factor for you? Simply a lack of fun. Don't get me wrong. These abstract games are very fun and quick, strategic games to play with people, but they do lack an element of fun. Okay. Well, I guess no one can hear me now. Are you having some technical? We're having some technical difficulties uh, on the dice tower, but that's okay. Let me go back here and talk about the perfect union again. Now, the Perfect Union, <laughs> hey, that's the beauty of live radio. You know, why don't we just go ahead and share. Okay, let me talk about the China question. Basically, when it comes to fun factor in a game, it's hard for me to determine uh, the rating for a game. I always, I, you know, sometimes my ratings are subjective. But I'm looking for a game that's just a lot of fun to play, a game that's just gives me a blast. And China and Web of Power, both similar games, are really, really fun to play. The problem with them is that they just lack the thing where everyone sits around the table laughing and having a good time. You know, when I stab someone else in a game and I, and I backstab them in a game, everyone laughs. It's fun. When, I, when you're in an auction and you just beat someone else out by a little bit, it's a lot of fun. But for uh, Web of Power, it was fun, but it wasn't, it wasn't the, the spark of fun that would bring it up to a 10. So that's why I said, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean there was no fun. I meant there was less fun. And by fun, I mean fun. <laughs> you know, that's funny, Tom, because when I played Chinatown, I had, I had that kind of fun because it was really great saying, I ain't trading with you. <laughs> and I got the piece that you want. There's no way in the world I'll trade with you. I had a lot of fun in that game, so I don't know what you're talking about. Well, well Joe, you're... Well, I'll keep talking. Are we going to do a one-mic show tonight? No, oh, possibly. <laughs> anyway, all righty then. So what's next here? Player categories. Player categories. All right, now last week we did a segment where we, uh, we, we decided that each week we will talk about a different type of player that we play against. Uh, last week I did the, um, the Captain Ahab, and he's the guy that will go do anything he has to do to take you out of contention of winning the game, no matter what the cost. Right. Well... This week, uh, I did one that we've all heard of, and I thought we'd just bring it up for discussion since he is definitely one of the times of players, and that's the Kingmaker. And uh, the Kingmaker is the guy who, sometime during a game, he'll decide that he is no longer in contention to win the game, and so he'll help someone else to win the game by making decisions or doing things that will definitely not help him but will help the other player. Do you mean deliberately? Deliberately. Deliberately doing these things. Oh, okay. And uh, have I ever done that, Tom? Yes. Well, <laughs> see, there's different kinds of kingmakers. Some people, they get really irritated, and they say, well, if I'm never going to, if you know, you took me out of the game, so you're going down now. In fact, I believe I heard, well, I'm just going to do everything in my power to make sure that this so-and-so person doesn't win. Who, um, <laughs> who would say something like that? Then again, there's people, they play a game called kingmaker, so what do you expect? Right, right. Yeah, but, okay, where's the line, though? Because I've been accused of being a kingmaker before, and I say, no, I'm not kingmaking. I'm making the best decision for me at this point. And you're like, yeah, but you're helping him. But, you know, so how do you decide if someone's kingmaking or not? When you know they're not going to... What do you do in that situation, Tom? When you... Like a game for... A game like um, like uh, that railroad game, Martin Wallace railroad game. What's it Age called? Age of Steam. Age In Age of Steam, I think there's a certain point in Age of Steam when you just know you're not going to win. All right? And yeah, but I don't think Age of Steam is a good example because in Age of Steam, you can still try and maximize your own position without affecting anyone else. But let's say there's a game where there's a trading thing. And you, and okay. you can trade either player... And either player, whatever they give you is going to benefit you, 
but like it may not... Like, who's the boss or China? Right, Trump. And it, but it, it's going to benefit you equally from either person. But whichever person you trade with is going to win the game. What do you do? I met a game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And metagaming means, for you that don't know, metagaming is a term that we use for people who take a, a previous gaming experience from a whole different game and, and, and hold a grudge or take that experience over to the next game. Right. Okay. Well. So that's the Kingmaker. And I'm sure that we all know the Kingmakers. Yeah. I, I'm sitting next to one. <laughs> okay. My category I got from Rick Thornquist. He, he suggested it. And it's the Clinker. And this is the person who sits there and just keeps playing with their pieces. Clink, clink, clink. They take the house and the road from settlers. And they clink them together. Clink, clink, clink. They take the cards and they bend them back and forth. Flip, 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 flip. They sit wouldn't there and they tap flip? the table. Wouldn't tap, it be a tap, flipper? Tap, tap, tap. Or I don't want to call them a flipper. Or a tapper? Because that sounds like a dolphin. They're just well, no- noisemakers. <laughs> yeah, noisemakers. But we'll call them the clinker for short. Because like that's girl, what we're going to throw them in. Okay. These, be- these people don't annoy me too much, but every once in a while... It gets annoying. I guess for me, the most annoying factor is the fact that they're playing on my game. There's been times when I'm like, stop playing with the pieces and listen to the rules instruction. Because these people sometimes get so caught up in their little clinkiness that they uh, I think that sometimes don't that's, listen to the game. I think sometimes that's actually strategy, Tom. <laughs> they're just trying to divert your attention. <laughs> click, click, click. I've actually played a war game against a guy once who was a clinker. And it was rather annoying because... Not only was he a clinker, but he was one of those analysis paralysis kind of guys. And so he would just sit there and stare at the board, clink, 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 clink. And I just sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there, and it just drove me nuts. Yeah. All right. Well, those are our two categories. Add them to last week's two, and we'll keep do, adding a couple every week until we have 100 game categories, gamer categories, and then we'll go on and on forever. Well, we handled that pretty well there with our one mic to two mic to one mic to two yeah, mic. Yeah, we had technical difficulties. Next time, Tom, we got to make sure we check our batteries before <laughs> we start the show. You know, so every week we learn a little bit, and I think by the time we get to episode 39, we should be okay. Why 39? I just picked it out of the hat. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, we're about to talk about our top ten game experiences, but before we got to that, we wanted to, to mention the IGA Awards, the International Gaming Awards. This is... A unique award because it's basically, um, basic, basically it's a award that's not sponsored by any association. Like Essen Awards is is sponsored by uh, a, a group that a newspaper group in in Germany. Mm-hmm. Origins obviously is sponsored by Gamma, yeah. and so on and so forth. But this is just a and bunch of gamers who got together and they're trying to make the game, the games they pick to be the best game of the year. That's the only requirement. There's did, nothing else. Did you hear the, Mar- the mighty Mark went down over at Gamma? Do you even know what I'm talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Mark's, Mark Mark Stahilo, Stahilo? Santilo. 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 He's no longer part of Gamma. I don't know what that means, though. It means that Origins might be better next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, I, just in I a nutshell, I mean. Well, we'll see. At least um, that's what I've read. Yeah, I, I read that, too, but I, didn't, I don't know what it means. So. Well, we'll find out. But anyway, the... The IGA gives out two awards each year. They give out one to the best historical simulation, which I believe went to the Sword of Rome. Woohoo! Um, they had Memoir 44. Our, our correspondent, the... Walt O'Hara, will give the, the full details on that later. Okay. And then this... So they, are, they already handed that one out. Now they just announced the nominations. They're going to announce the winner, I don't know when, soon, eventually. And then they'll hand the, the, the award out to the winner. They usually hand it out at Essen. But if the winner is not at Essen, they would hand it out somewhere else. So mm. far, the winner has always been at Essen. So here are the nominees for the multiplayer category. There's two different categories, multiplayer and two-player. So here's the categories for multiplayer. The winners or the nominees? You said the, the nominees. Okay. Um, and so here they are. Shadows over Camelot, Louis Fourteen, Reef Encounter, Struggle of Empires, Antiquity, Cathedral, YS, Carcassonne, The City, DeMont, Ticket to Ride Europe, Around the World in 80 Days, and Ubongo. Now, most of those games I played, I have not played uh, Around the World in 80 Days, which is kind of weird because you, you, you would think it would be the kind of yeah. game I'd you like be around the, playing. You, you, always talk, you like the book. I know you like the book, so I mean. Well, I don't know if that has. You've mentioned the book before, I should say. Right. Well, either way. I didn't like the Louis the Fourteenth that much at all. No, and you know what? Neither did I. It's one of the few times that Joe and I both don't like a game. Maybe we should do a review on that one next week. Well, neither one of us has it. Yeah, that's what the, while we're on that, a couple of people have suggested to me that we 
we, we review a game at the same time, like the same game, like we, to, we together review a game so that we can get opposing viewpoints of the same game. So if you think that's an interesting idea, I'd like to know. So if, if you think that's a good idea, maybe you could email us and tell me. Okay. I, I, I think I'd like to do that. It'd be kind of fun. So he, It'll force Tom to play games with me. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> forces me to play games with you. Here's the two-player category. Dungeon Twister, Pajords, Jambo, Oceana, Roma, and War of the Ring. Now, both... Both categories are full of good games. I mean, we may disagree with one or two of them, but I really think they did a good job at picking the sure. best Euro games, at least. I know, Joe, I well, agree. Th- th- this isn't for war games. The war game category has already been done. Yeah, we won't so these, talk about that. These are the best of the Euro games. Um, from I, The timing is a little, I think it's like from the beginning. It's, it's, it's basically from summer 2004 to summer 2005. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know the exact rules, we, but you can go look them we, up at their website. If you look at the nominees, I mean, Shadows over Camelot's a good game. Reef and Connor's a great game. Struggles of Empires is a great game. Have you played Antiquity? I haven't. Uh, it's Splatter. And <laughs> Splatter's artwork um, usually turns me off. But it, it's also just a really huge, heavy game, and I just haven't had a chance to get it. Cathedral's a great game. We played that one years ago, didn't we? Right. How Cathedral can actually came just... out in 1999. No. No, I'm sorry. 2003? It came out a couple of years ago, and then they're re- they're republishing it. Ah, uh, okay. And it didn't get its fair shot the first time through. Why is this? I guess it's an okay. It's very Euroish, so I don't like it that much. But you know, Carcassonne's Carcassonne, so we can debate that all day long. And what is, what is how do you pronounce this other game? Dam- Damitan- Damiant? Di- Di- Diamant, I think. What is I played that? that one. It's really light. Basically, it's just push your luck. You're all going through a mine together, and you decide when you're going to pull out of the mine. And when you pull out, you get all the jewels that've been collected so far. But if you you wait too long, you can eventually, the, the, the mine caves in, or you get gassed or eaten by snakes or whatever. Uh, ticket to Ride Europe, which I think is not as good as Ticket to Ride Normal, but, you know, anyway. This episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games, whose most recent battleground faction, the High Elves, is currently in stores. Okay, so which, we'll start with the general strategy category. Which do you think is going to win? Not, not, not which do you want to win, but which do you think will win? General strategy? I, I think Shadows of Camelot will win, just because of the, the ooh-la-la factor. I think so, too. I think Shadows of Camelot is going to win, if only because I don't think it will win any other awards. And not, not because it's a bad game, but because I think the timing of it, it it's too early to do anything with the Spiel des Jeurs. And I, I just, everyone, well, almost everybody, there's a few people, vocal people who hate the game, but everybody seems to really, really enjoy it. I, and so I, I'm, I like it. So I'm, I, it's not my favorite, I, I on, the think list. It will it's not my favorite on this list, but I like the game. I was going to get a copy from uh, some, a friend of mine. He never, ended, he never sent it to me, so I never got a copy. No. You're going to keep saying it, aren't you? <laughs> I want a copy, and I keep on saying I wanted a copy, but I never got a copy. Well, anyway, so which do you want to win now? You know, that's, I, I had to think about that because there's two games, either Struggle of Empires, which is a, almost a give me. Because but see, I like Struggle of Empires net, but now that I play Conquest of Empires, it's hard to beat the shiny bit. Yeah, and, or Reef Encounter. And that was, but I really liked Reef Encounter. I know that sounds so unmanly of me, but it's a really good game. So actually, I'm going to go with Reef Encounter. That's the one I want to win. Well, I like Reef Encounter, but I think Cathedral got shafted the first time through because it, there was only a print run of 500, and I managed to pick one of those up. What was the print run on Reef Encounter? Same, be- same, pretty much. Oh, no, Reef Encounter was 1,000. Yeah. But they're reprinting both games, and so Reef Encounter will probably be eligible again in the future year when they reprint it. But I, I, I think Cathedral is a really good Settlers type of game. I really enjoy it. I'd like to see it win. I think its chances are small. I think we're going to see Shadows Over Camelot. Maybe we'll see um, Louis the Fourteenth. I sure hope not. Ticket to Ride Europe? Though. I don't. Maybe think so. we'll see Ticket to Ride Europe. I don't know. It. I, I think there's actually competition. There's no clear front runner. Who, who are the guys on the IGA board? Anybody we know? Uh, Greg Schlesinger, Greg Alex Nevikis, um, Rick Thornquist. Those Rick are... Thornquist. I never heard of him. He must be some kind of weirdo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He, oh, that's right. He's my lackey. No, he's 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 sitting there right now trying to think of a, a name for you, Joe. Actually, uh, Rick is my lackey. Don't let anyone fool you. You can go to the internationalgamersawards.net, and you can look at all. The, they'll, they'll tell you about their award. They'll tell you about the history of the award, and the there's a lot of the a lot of the people on the jury you may not know. Uh, Scott Alden's on the jury. Not, from, who in the world is Scott Alden? He runs BoardGameGeek.com. Oh, Aldi. Um. Greg Alec Nevikis, he runs thegamesjournal.com. There's a Frank Branham, who's uh, is a game designer. He used to interesting picture too. Yeah, Stuart <laughs> Daggert, he runs Counter Magazine, which is a imprint 
Magazine. Alan Howe also is an uh, associate with Counter Magazine. Um, Peter Sarrett, the Peter. Game Report. Mm-hmm. Greg Schlesinger. Mike Siggins uh, He's from like Sumo time, Magazine. Yeah. Rick Thornquist, who's the newest edition this year. So it's a, it's a pretty... Uh, They're letting anybody in. <laughs> no, actually, it's a pretty austere. Next year, it'll be Tom Vassell on that and Joe Seven on the Wargaming one. I mean, what in the world? This is like whatever. no, that that would be pretty bad. No, I, th- I think they, I think they said one time that they would let me in if I was Korean, but I'm not Korean, so. <laughs> oh well. Well, you got a little Korean flag on Board Game Geek. Yeah, I do, but the, the, maybe that will work. I also have the little flag now. Can I be on the IGA committee? If I was voting, my first pick would be Cathedral. Um, my second pick would be probably uh, Ticket to Ride Europe, and then Shadows Over Camelot. Although, oh, I, I really do like Struggle Vampires and Reef Encounter. Oh, I can't believe you didn't make top three for Reef Encounter. I, I really like that game. Well, either way, now let's go to the two-player uh, category. And that, for me, that one's easy. Well, it actually, it's, it's a little harder. It's, it's, I, it's, it's hands for, down for, for me. For Joe, it's War of the Ring because no. I'm pretty sure that's the only one he's played. The rest of them really sound good. Well, Dungeon Twister's a lot of fun. I really, really what highly is, recommend what is Dungeon this? Twister. Revol- Revolt of Roma. I, I, Rome, I know nothing about it. Uh, um, it. It's a queen game, so. But uh, Jambo, I'm still waiting for. I sent it to myself from Origins in the mail, and apparently it's still not here. I'm missing like ten games. Are you seeing the Korean mail system is kind of slow? Yeah, really slow. I'm still waiting for Dungeon Twister too. I've got to play that Origins, and I'm still waiting. But Dungeon Twister is my vote there, with a very, very complimentary nod towards War of the Ring, and I do think War of the Ring is going to sweep this one. I hope so. So we'll great, see. Great game. So, so uh, what, what game did you play this week, Tom? Any? I played some trick-taking games. Uh, Win place Trump, I believe, by Mayfair Games slash Phalanx. A trick-taking game by Phalanx, wow. which is kind of odd. And basically, the the game you, the cards that you won were your hand for the next round, which was really fun. Phalanx Games got a lot has a lot of non-war games. What was the other one we played the other day? Uh, Alexander the Great, which you, which sounds like it's a war game. But, but it's, it's really it's not. not, it's not and go game. west. Go That's west. Definitely not a war game. No. So I, I don't. I wouldn't know how to categorize failings. Would you? As 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 a board game company, uh, they make war games. It's got really good. They just got they good, make good, non-war games. Good quality. Good quality board games. Yeah. Now, the, but whether the game itself is any good, I don't know. That's debatable. But the quality is pretty good. I really like their um, house divided. Is really good. Co- good quality. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm. It's pretty. I. I I, there's some things I didn't like about the game, but man, you couldn't argue how nice it is. Yep. Failing games, even the Alexander the Great, the boards are just beautiful. The Go West game, as much as I wasn't a big fan of it, it sure looks good on the table. Yeah. I mean, it had these big wooden wagon counters that you moved, and that, I mean, it just just looked really good. So that's what I played recently. I also played a, another trick taking game called Control Nut, and I played Manhattan, mm-hmm. and. I I don't remember what else I played. Uh, Did you use the uh, Godzilla variant? No, no. You know, I always end up teaching new people Manhattan, and I never use Godzilla when I first teach people. So I never end up getting to play uh, Manhattan with a Godzilla. But I will. It's coming. Okay. Yeah, so three of the, three of the four games I played this week all started with the letter A. Can you guess what they were, Tom? Um, Attila? With your <laughs> wife? <laughs> no. Um... Three, the ASL, There's ASL, one. and ASL. No, ASL, ASL, SK, and Ambush. <laughs> oh. Well, those are three of the four, and then I played a, a really, well, let me tell you about ASL. I thought you had dropped ASL, I mean, a- Ambush in favor of ASL. You're well, still doing Ambush? Uh, ambush, I just, I'm really into the whole, the writing part of it, just the whole, the, I guess the role-playing aspect right. of it. I just really enjoy that, that and i got to see what's going to happen to my characters. Once I think all my characters have died off, then maybe I'll quit. I don't, I'm sorry. If I, all my original characters are dead, I'll finish. Once his character dies. Once Sergeant Joe you, you, takes you a bullet You got shot. Vassal, Private Vassal got shot. Yeah, but I hope I die in your game. But you got you dragged. Can't, you can't mangle my story. You got, dra- you got dragged to safety, so you lived. Yeah, but anyway. Too bad. No, anyway, I've been playing on Vassal, which is kind of funny. He's always using me. <laughs> I've been playing on Vassal, V-A-S-L, on the internet. And uh, I've been playing a lot of starter kit. And uh, I'm playing with a couple of guys right now. I'm playing three or four simultaneous games, and it's just really, it's a real learning experience. And um, I could rant about this for a while. This whole, uh, I don't even want to talk about it. Just yeah, well, we can get to that next time. I'll, we'll, okay, we'll, yeah. Next show, we'll, we'll have a Joe's rant. I'll have a, I'll have a rant. And then I also played a really stupid, cheesy 
dumb game, but we had a couple come over for dinner the other night, and uh, great, good, good friends of ours, Morel and Janelle, and uh, kind of their names rhyme. Isn't that cool? Well, anyway, <laughs> yeah, we played that battle for Battle of the Sexes game. Wow, even with house rules, it's still horrible. Did you already play that once? I've tried Monica, and it just—it seems like a good concept, and it's, it's a good fun. It's it's light, and everyone laughs at the questions, but it's it's decidedly tilted towards the women. I mean, the men questions are very easy. Like, what do you put in a car to make sure that the engine doesn't seize up? Well, the, the, the way the game plays is the, the women have to answer questions that men would know, and the men are supposed to answer questions that the women would know. Man, and this 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 is not going to fly at board game geek right now with their. There's sexism on the, yeah, on, whatever. The, on the geek. Anyway, so the, this, this game is not politically correct, okay? Well, neither are we. Ha-ha! <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm not going to say what I was just thinking. Yeah, good. Anyway, so the, the women questions, the, 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 the questions the women have to answer are very easy. I mean, just real s- silly stuff like, what is the sport that has an oblong ball that's made <laughs> out of pig skin? You know, things like that. And the girls are like, duh. And the guy questions are like, who is the French designer from, you know, on Saks Fifth Avenue? And the ladies don't even know the answers to their own questions most of the time. And so I added a very, I added my own house rule that said that the ladies had to answer the question. If they couldn't, if they couldn't answer the question, then we didn't have to answer the question. And even still, the, me and uh, Morel, we got stomped by the ladies. And so that game is probably going to go on my giveaway list. I'm sick of it. Yeah, it's one of those games that I didn't even want to touch. Anyway. Uh, okay, now our top ten list. We love doing top tens. They're fun. And this one's one that uh, that really I enjoyed doing because it, it brought back good memories. Yeah, this, is a, this was a fun list for myself, too. This was our top ten gaming experiences. And you know what? Probably two weeks after we did the show, I'll remember some fun game that I, I, I forgot. And I, I actually came up with about 20 experiences. Yeah, I, I had plenty, too. And I crossed them off. It was hard to rank them. But these are different things throughout our lives playing games that affected us and I remember as just that was a really fun time uh, a memorable playing that game right. and so we've kind of and um, yeah so why don't you go first this week Tom yeah okay Joe always goes first so I'll go first uh, I remember very distinctly uh, maybe I was 8 or 9 this is your number 10 this right? is my number 10 and it's playing Monopoly playing Monopoly with my parents I don't remember uh, a lot about the game I remember them teaching me and the properties and I thought it was cool and I remember I remember crying because I I thought I was going to lose. You still do that. Yeah, and then I and then I managed to get all four railroads, and my dad got a card that said go to the nearest railroad and pay the owner double, and from that point on I slowly came back and won the game, and I'll never forget that. It was such a great time, and I wonder now if my parents let me win. Hell, sandbagging going on. There. I don't know, but I. You think if your you parents? Know, it really got me into games. My parents played a game with me. Parents play games to your kids. Do you think if your parents knew what how it all turned out today with you and your whole weird board game thing? That yeah, they, they probably would have not taught me games. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I, I really remember playing Monopoly. Uh, I, I, I remember playing Monopoly a lot with my brothers and sisters, but it was that first game. Uh, we, we actually ditched Monopoly eventually and played Solar Quest, which is like Space Monopoly, except the prices are more obscene. So all right. that's my number 10, Monopoly with my parents. All right. Cool. My number 10 is a monster game. It's uh, Vak de Rhein Part 2. I got to play it uh, with Joe Yost, the designer. and he, he, It was just cool because it's this game. It's this huge game. He even blew the map up to be bigger than it, what it comes stock. And Always he, a plus. <laughs> yeah. And we had, it, we had it at Origins. And uh, Joe, if you ever get to meet Joe Yost, he's just a really cool guy. And he's half Korean. I didn't know that. And, uh, so we were, have, we were talking about Korea and things like that. But uh, we stayed up really late, and he was just showing me this game. And I just really, really enjoyed it. It's nothing like playing a game with the designer of the game. And especially if it's a monster game that's got a... a a graphic novel. I mean, not graphic, but a huge novel for the rule book. It's, it's just cool to. Uh, I had a great time. I, I'll, I'll never forget it. And I look, I'm, next year, I'm, I'm going to try to hook up with Joe again. If he goes. If he goes. All right. If, well, if, if, if Joe I go, goes. Oh, because I already know that. You know, I'm, I'm having my, the Joe Stedman Scholarship Fund. Yeah, we keep forgetting to say that pay for Joe and Tom to come to Origins. Yes, together. <laughs> you, it's, it's only about you know for two thousand dollars you can sponsor <laughs> two white guys in their late. You know, their early 30s, late 20s. I think you should drop out all that. Just sponsor two needy missionaries. Two needy to missionaries origins. to Origins. <laughs> all right. My number nine game is Axis and Allies. Again, not one of my favorite games to play today, but I, my experience, and I, I, I'm having a hard time pinpointing one exact time, but it was in the summer when I was a kid, and we played it outside on the porch, set up the table with the other kids, and we all played Axis and Allies. <laughs> it was yeah. just... Those were the days. You sat there and played for six hours in a row. The game ended. You started a new one. 
Uh, there was arguing and yelling and throwing of money and occasional kicking the tables and nuclear bombs or what have you. It was just a lot. We played. What is a nuclear? There's nuclear bombs in there? That's when someone kicks the table. Oh, that's the, the cat. The cat bomb when the cat jumps <laughs> up on the table. And you know, sometimes I just sit back and think about just how much fun that was. Drinking lemonade, playing X and Allies on a hot summer day on the porch. Cool. You know, that, you just saying access now is I forgot that that would probably would have been on my list, but I don't know why I forgot it. I really had good memories of that game myself with my dad and my brother. But uh, all right, my number nine is um, a game that I really don't like, and I've only played it once, but I had a really good time playing it. Oh, I like it. It's uh, Sid Meier's the Dance Civilization game, and uh, it's like a what, ten hour game. No, it's actually called Sid Meier's Civilization, the board game. Okay, whatever. <laughs> it's the Eagle the Eagle Games version, the one that's really really long. I think they're all long, but yeah, it is really long. So we played me and Tom and this guy named Ryan and a few other people, Sam, another guy named Sam. We played this game all set all day Saturday, and uh, I was doing so so. And, we, and we, we played it over several nights too. We, over we several nights, it's a continuing game, right? And I was doing so so, but I was not in contention for first place. I think I was coming. Out, I, I counted the points, and I think I was somewhere like third. I place. was kicking everyone's butt. Yeah, Tom was Tom was set to win, and the game was almost over. And then Ryan, being the um, the nice guy that he is, I was able to put on my little devil horns and, and start whispering in his ear a, a, a trade. And see, he really needed money for armies, and so I said, Ryan, you know, you're, they're going to attack you. You really need to give me. I, I'll buy your. Uh, what are those things called? Wonders of the world. I'll buy your wonders of the world off of you. Hmm. And he's like, oh, well, how much will you give me? And I said, I'll give, hmm. you, I'll give you 30 coins for all of them. So he gave me, <laughs> how many did he give me? Like a whole stack. He had a bunch Too many. Of I don't think it was a legal deal. Well, either way, it's all fair in love and war. So he gave me all of his uh, wonders of the world. And so the game ended not long later. And when we revealed what we had, you should have seen Tom's face. No, I was already annoyed. My face was already <laughs> and irritated. It was That's a stupid trade. It's like a monopoly when you pay someone $1 for all their properties. Hey, it, it, if they shake hands on it, it's fair. And so hmm. that was wow. one of my, my number nine experience was the, the evil trade. From Sid Meier's Civilization. My number eight game is uh, Railroad Tycoon. Uh, I just played at Origins, the prototype game, but I played with Rick Thornquist and, and my, my friend Bob and, and a couple other people, and we played, and I don't know why, it was a fun game and a fun situation. We're sitting there with Glenn Drover right nearby and Keith Bloom from Eagle Games, and they were just explaining the game, and I don't know why. It just was a really good experience. I got in the zone of just having a really fun time that transcended the game itself, and maybe it's because it's so recent that I remember it better, but I just I had a really good time. So that's my number eight game, playing Railroad Tycoon at Origins. Well, I think there's a high correlation with all of our, our games here. It's really not the game. It's just the people that we're with. I agree. But, uh, all right, that's why a lot of Joe's games include me. <laughs> Whatever. All right, number eight for me is uh, uh, Time's Up, and uh, we, we played Time's Up, the, the party game, uh, at my house, uh, what, three years ago? I had a housewarming party, and uh, it was the first time I played it. The second time I played it, I think. But we had we had some non-typical gamers at the house, including the pastor of our church and his wife, and uh, another pastor. And we just we just had a really a really good time. And uh, watching these people, I got pictures of it today, and I can still look at these pictures of the of my my previous pastor making you know just trying to act like he's He-Man, standing up going and then trying to imitate something. Well, it was just a really really good time. Some of my funniest gaming memories have been playing Times Up. Uh, I, this is a great, great fun game. That, that particular game did teach me that Time's Up should probably not be played with elderly people. <laughs> it, they, they, they may have fun, but it's just they it's had, too fast for them. It's not, it's not only too fast, but most of the questions are pretty much based on pop culture. And also you have to stand up and act out things. Right. It's just they, with young people. They were good sports about it because in that game, you don't have to know what the word means or who the person is, I mean, and you can still do it. But, yeah, yeah it's, it's still a great time. All right. My number seven is Looping Louie. And I remember because it was two years ago when I started the board game club at my school, and one of the, the games that I used, and I since gotten rid of it because it, 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 the, the game became the problem. People came just for the game. But it was Looping Louie. It's a game where you hit these buttons and you're trying to make the airplane bounce. It's a really dumb dexterity game. But I had a 60-person tournament set up. <laughs> and I just, I'll just i never forget that. There was people crowded around screaming and yelling. I had two Looping Louie games set up running at the same time. I think even Joe was I was one of the was contestants. Involved, yeah. but some, I, got lim- some, I got eliminated in the second round. Some eighth-grader won, and it was, it was just yelling and screaming, and it was just that 
Who, who won? What was their name? Uh, was it David Bonus won. David, David Bonus, Bonus's name uh, was. One of our he won the game. He won the tournament, and then he, he gave his prize, which was a free board game, to his girlfriend, who is no longer his girlfriend. So they're <laughs> the, the, uh, the sadness junior of high. junior high. Oh, the, the, oh. Right, so that's my number seven, Looping Louie Tournament. Now, my, uh, my number seven is Kingmaker. Um, in 19, or 2004, at Origins, I entered uh, a Kingmaker game for, uh, for a prize. And uh, it was a very, it's, we played on a, a big blown-up version of Kingmaker uh, with little miniatures and everything for the different, uh, royal, for the different families. And I was, doing, I was doing average, I guess, but I was, able to, I was able to scoop up enough votes with really out anyone noticing that as soon as I had just the right amount of votes, I crowned myself. I crowned myself the king, and everyone was like, "What? What is he doing?" I called. They called Parliament, and I didn't even call it. Someone else did, and everything worked out where I was secretly able to do this. And you should have just seen the look on everyone's face when I was like, "Well, I have this person, this vote, this vote, this vote, and I have the Archduke," and da da da. da. And they're like, "What?" And uh, I won, and I got a pennant from it. So it was just cool. Yeah, he still has that pennant hanging on his wall. It's cool. Yeah. So Joe's number seven is Kingmaker. Kingmaker. My number six is Duel of Ages. Of course, my favorite game. Uh, but one particular game I played with my friend Ryan. He and I play Duel of Ages a lot. We, we're very compatible. We, we have a good time. We both like the imagination factor. And we played a 20 character on 20 character, which is a mega game of Duel of Ages. And it was this huge game, and we made a story out of it. And it lasted for a very long time, and it was just a really good time. I, I really enjoyed playing games with Ryan. I miss him. He's no longer in my gaming group. But that was a good game. My number six, Duel of Ages. My number six is a game I talked about earlier. I won't go uh, too much into it. It's Battle for Germany. But really, the, the experience is just every year at Origins, I play against Skip Franklin, good, good friend Skip, and every year he beats me. And I think my record right now is Skip is four losses and one win. And so <laughs> he schools me. But it's just a lot of time. Skip is one of my favorite opponents to play against. My number five game is Pit. Playing it with my family. As, I, as we grew up, we always played Pit. On New Year's Eve, it was our tradition. We always played pit because on New Year's Eve, you're allowed to be as loud as you want. And we were always loud. My parents always invited over a lot of single people who had nowhere else to go. And they'd come and we'd play games. And it was just, it got to be rather insane sometimes. You know, as a young child, I've watched. And then as I got older, I got involved. But sometimes people got so, you know, we play with the bell. Because you, you, you got to play with the bell when you're playing with pit. And one guy got so excited, he hit the bell. And his hands were so sweaty that it stuck to his hand. And so when he put his, pulled his hand back up, the bell flew up and hit the ceiling and the light on the <laughs> ceiling. And that was all exciting and everything. And it's just a wild, wild time. And people think that we're killing each other, but it's just Pit. Pit is the only game I've ever gotten my current pastor to play. That's true. <laughs> my number five is a miniatures game. Actually, it's, four, it's Warhammer 40K. Uh, I had just I've had lots of good experiences playing this, but there's one time when I got three. I, I use orcs, and I took three thousand points of orcs, and I took on two guys who both had marines, and they really, really underestimated the power of the wah. And I just cleaned the table, and it was just great to see these vanilla marines running and jumping and hiding behind all the terrain. And I just, I'll just i never forget it. It was just really, really fun. I think, I think I, I, I've had some enjoyable games of 40K in the past. I played a 6,000-point game one time, 6, which is ridiculous, but it was really fun. Yeah, those big mega games are just fun. My number four game is Puerto Rico, played with the designer, Andrea Seaforth. I played him at Origins uh, 2004. And I beat him. <laughs> and that was just exciting this, for me. This, this reminds me of number 10. I think that Mr. Uh, Seaforth might have let you win. Yeah. Kind of like and your so parents. I wonder that. He might have He might have let me win. And, and, in fact, there was a lot of table talk during the game, which would have annoyed the uber-competitive folk who play at World Board Gaming Championships. But <laughs> we had a good time. And, I, and I, he was just a really nice guy, and he deserves all the accolades he gets. My number four is uh, Panzer Group Guderian. It's an old game. Um, Anyway, it was this is Last Origins again, another one of my memories. But I played it all night long. Me, Joe Yost, and the Mountain Man, Gary Christensen. We played it all night long, and we had all really started getting bickery, I guess, irritated each other by the halfway through the night, and we had to end up calling it. And uh, it was just a fun time, though. We we just had a blast. And afterwards, we went over to uh, Denny's and harassed the waitresses. I, I guess that <laughs> sounds fun. Woohoo! My number three game is Hero Quest. Uh, as a friend, not 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 the new Hero Escape, but Hero Quest. As a kid, one time my friend brought out Hero Quest, which was it's like a, a dungeon crawl game in a box with miniatures, 
and it blew my mind. And he said, I hate being a game master. I said, oh, let me try it out. And so I tried it out, and I was hooked, 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 hooked. I liked controlling the dungeon. I liked making new maps. I liked making puzzles for my friends. Control and freak. we had some really fun games in control those times. Control freak. I am a control freak and proud of it. You play games with me, I always put the money in the bank. I guess it's one of my player categories coming up. Yes. The guy who has to move all the pieces on the table. The control freak. Yes. My number three is the card game Spades, just the public domain game Spades. But uh, one time in particular, the very first time I met my father-in-law, my wife and I went over to introduce me to my father-in-law, and we played Spades. And uh, it sounds boring, but the interesting thing is the whole game, he never said my name. He just called me stupid. (laughs) Pretty cool, huh? So I'll never forget it. And to this day, I, I talk to him about that. So he's just like, it's your turn, stupid. Hey, tell stupid. It's uh, <laughs> That was a dumb card to play. Tell stupid. And my, my wife was like, oh, my goodness, Dad, stop. You know, but it was a good time. Well, I guess. Shows, 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 shows the good times a little bit. Uh, I was the not. first one to marry into the family of eight kids, you know, and yeah. the, the whole intimidation factor going on here. My number two game is Memoir 44, an overlord scenario at Origins with Eric Hadamont and... And Rick Thornquist and Ward Batty and Jeremy Avery and it was just a four on four match. It was a really good time. I'm sitting there yelling at my players. I was the the commander against Eric, who was the commander of the opponent's army. If there's any way to play a memoir, it's the Overlord scenario. It's just so much fun. If you ever get a chance to play it, do it. Hmm. I had a good time playing that once. All right, my uh, that's the Overlord scenario of uh, Memoir 44. Yeah. My number two game is uh, Tigers and Euphrates. Now, uh, I owned this game for a while, and I still really like this game. I've played it quite a bit on the Internet. And the problem with Tigers and Euphrates has always been that if there's one weak player, it really throws the game off, in my opinion. If there's even two weak players, it's not hardly worth playing. Well, I played it one time with three other guys, um, Bob and Shin and, and Tom. The four of us played, and it was just intense, because all four of us had played the game before, and it was just really, 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 really good, and it was one of my favorite game memories. And I believe it or not, Tom won. And so, you know, I, I can't believe it's still my number two game experience. But I am the champion. It was just the tension. Friend. The tension, I guess, knowing yeah, that it was any, good, little, good any, any little mistake you made, you were done. And so every move, you knew that with the caliber of everybody playing, that you just had to do good moves. And it was, it was good. Right. Now for our number one games. Number two for Joe is Tigers and Euphrates. But I need a song clip. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> my number one game is, is uh, Lost Cities. With my wife. And I play a lot of games with my wife. Not as many as you might think. We, we don't play. I, I think Joe and his wife probably play ten times as much as we do. Um, but we, we play games occasionally. A lot of times I get I say, this new two-player game. But it all started from Lost Cities. I mean, we used to play Checkers, and I hated Checkers. But we played Lost Cities for the first time, and we played it again, and we played it again. And she and I both loved it. It was a good connection. And I can't get very far in my board game reviews and stuff without my wife's help and I just appreciate her and it's all thanks to Lost Cities. Thank you, Kinesia. (laughs) Alright, my number one game is one of the few times in my life I've gotten a chance to play face-to-face seven-player diplomacy. Uh, It's just a hard game to get people to play together face-to-face. I played a ton online, but one of these times I got to play face-to-face and there was a bunch of guys here in Korea, including Tom, and uh, this is my, my... It was just really intense. It's a game that gives you uh, an upset stomach when you play it because it's the tension. You're just like, oh, what's going to happen? It. Whoa. I hate it. <laughs> your, your hair and your neck stands up when you read the orders out loud. But the one thing in particular, all I had to do is say, fleet to breast. In a Tom's Boo. <laughs> it was when one of the other players totally lied and backstabbed Tom. No, he didn't lie. No, that's right. He didn't lie. He just, he just, didn't. He just never told me he, was, he wasn't going to do it. Right. He said, I'm not going to do this, this, and this. And he left that one little unit, and that one little unit landed in, in Tom's backyard. That just destroyed my whole game. And it was great. <laughs> Uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. See, Joe's number one game is against me. Well, don't forget now, Worthington Games giving two board games away. Send us in the name of our friend, uh, and we already given clues about him, so you can go back in the show and listen to them. Send them to the Dice Tower, the, the Dice Tower, <laughs> the Dice Tower at gmail dot com. Email us there. If you have any questions or comments, email us at that site. Yep. Um, before we go now on our show, we're gonna we're gonna hear. From our roving reporter, Walt O'Hara, he's going to give us part one of a two-part report on the World Board Gaming Championships because he went and I didn't, so I asked him to tell me a bit about it. And this is it. We're signing off now, then it's going to close with him? Or? Right, and then I'll just say goodbye or something. So well, nice. you've been listening to the Dice Tower. This is Tom Vassell. And I'm Joe Stedman. And here's Walt O'Hara.
Tom asked me to put together an audio snippet on the recent uh, World Board Gaming Championship Convention in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, before we get started with this, um, I just wanted to say that I don't really have a dog to hunt in the competitive versus non-competitive com- controversy that's surrounding WBC at the moment. The truth is, I was only there for two days. I only get so many Wargaming brownie points a year, and I had just expended a bunch of them on Historicon two weeks previous at the same place, Lancaster, PA. So the best I can do is relay some general impressions. So here we go. WBC has a very rigid structure. Um, Attendees show up to play as many games as a human being can stand before collapsing from sheer exhaustion. There certainly is a heavy competitive element to the show. However, the strong com- tournament orientation of WBC shouldn't be construed as negatively as it has been on Board Geek and elsewhere. These are just people that are trying to play the best they can. I mean, you know, there certainly are uber competitive types that are in this thing for victory at any cost. I, I cop to that. I'm, I'm not one of them. You can spot these guys pretty easily. They'll, they'll have a notebook with them with, full of every conceivable opening move and every published scenario of Panzer Blitz, or they'll be furiously consulting a thick wad of strategy notes from their ten gazillion plays in Tikal or Carcassonne or Puerto Rico or whatever. Personally, I don't have a problem with people like that. I mean, I know I'll never be playing them at any level, so if they want to analyze the game to death, let them. Who cares? I just go to hang out with people I don't get to see but once a year. So all you oversensitive types, get over it. You don't like competition. Don't participate in tournaments. That's all I've got to say. There's plenty of room for open gaming at any convention, and believe me, there was plenty of room to go play anything at WBC. I got into a lot of games, and I sat in and just watched a bunch play because I, I just love board games. It's, they're fun to watch. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about my shopping list. I, I did drop a big wad of dough at uh, WBC and uh, am very happy with what I bought. Um, the big finds for me were Wellington by GMT, Combat Soldiers in the Battle of the Bulge by LBG, that's the Brawling Battleships guys, um, Empire of the Sun by GMT, Crusader Rex by Columbia, and uh, another micro game, Sergeants in the Sand by LBJ or LBG. Sorry, good list. Good it. list. Um, Wellington was my favorite game of the convention by far. Wellington is a close relative of, to the Napoleonic Wars by the same designer, Mark McLaughlin. I had opportunity to play the game with Mark himself, which is always fun because he's a gentleman at the root of it and quite a crazy guy. Um, he ended up buying all of us uh, shots of Cuvassier in the middle of the game, and we stopped and toasted each other for a game well done. We did. I guess that. that sort of <laughs> impacted my judgment since I went out and bought it the next day. Uh, Wellington is an area movement, card-driven design very similar to its cousin. I've played Nappy Wars many times since it came out in 2003, and it's kind of a big-picture grand strategy game. I like the diplomacy aspect of Nap- Nappy Wars, and Wellington is a bit different from that. The scale and scope of, the, of Wellington are far more narrow. Um, the Nappy Wars is played all over Europe. Wellington is in the Iberian Peninsula. The units are almost identical-looking, being a generic single-strength infantryman, a double-strength cavalryman, and a quadruple-strength artillery piece. They represent smaller troop sizes in Wellington, though. I mean, the scope of the game is far more tactical. The event cards are more reactive than strategic. There's a lot of take that in Wellington um, in the card play. The basic mechanics for both games are absolutely generic. Generic units, area movement, using the command points in the cards to activate troops. It's the same thing again. It's, uh, but it's the terrain on the map, the card events, and the siege rules that make the game fit so right with this subject material. It gives it a lot of local flavor. And Mark did his homework really, really well in researching those event cards, and they really make the game what it is. I had a blast playing this game at WBC, and I look forward to getting the next one in the series, Kudas Off, next year. All right, thanks, Waldo Harrow. That's part one of his two-part series, and we'll hear more from him next week. Thanks for listening to Dice Tower. See ya. Bye-bye. Yeah, good looking See ya. You Shut up. A lot of interesting things that I thought about when listening to this show. The first is our predictions of the IGA Awards were completely off. Tickets Ride Europe won, which I'm still a bit surprised about, just because of all the Ticket to Ride games, and I think they're all great and I enjoy Europe, 
I'm just surprised that it won while Ticket to Ride and Ticket to Ride Markland didn't, especially winning over such other games I thought would be much more popular. But just goes to show that we didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, also, the gaming experiences that we mentioned, that's to me, is still a fun thing to think about. Gaming experiences that I've experienced over the past years and over my whole life, just it's the experiences that make games great, even if the game itself isn't necessarily a terrific one. If you just have a wonderful time playing a game or just a really funny moment, you know, that that can just make it a time that you'll never forget. And I listen to these and listen to the people who used to be my game group. My game group changes every every year. I still got Sam, but you know, other than Sam, it seems like there's always people coming in and out, and they all have different personalities. I got the Kingmaker, I got the Clinker, you know. Still, um, and one one more interesting thing that you wouldn't know about uh, at this point, you if at least one point in this episode, you heard us talking really nicely about Board Game Geek, and that's because there was almost a well behind the scenes, there was a, a pretty major tiff between us and. Uh, board Game Geek. And when I say us and Board Game Geek, what I mean is between Joe and Dirk. Uh, we had made some joking comments about Board Game Geek, uh, Board Game Geek Speak, in our earlier episodes. And Dirk emailed us about them. And <laughs> the emails that went back and forth between Dirk and Joe, well, maybe they'll still, maybe they'll be friends someday. We'll see. Me and Aldi were more of a, well, what's the big deal? I, I thought parts of it were pretty funny, but I said, just that there's no clarification. We don't dislike Board Game Speak. In fact, Board Game Geek helps us get ready for 95% of the show. So I wanted to make it very clear that we enjoyed the site. I enjoy their podcast. I like Dirk. I like Aldi. Uh, Joe likes the site. Joe likes Aldi. Uh, well, with Joe and Dirk, we'll... Who knows where that... They probably don't even think about each other anymore. But it was really interesting for a while. And so that's why we were so pushing Board Game Geek. Nowadays, I push it because I still think it's a great site. I think it's only gotten better. I think the guild that we have there is a wonderful place to communicate and such. And so if you want to talk about this episode, tell us about your top ten gaming experiences. Why don't you go there? If you're interested in checking out some more, uh, go to the website at www.thedicetower.com. And if you're interested, check out funagaingames.com. Uh, who they host our show and they have a great selection of board games at low prices. And you'll find on that site my reviews, short podcasts I do with five minutes or less reviews. Uh, I should be putting up just a few at the same time as this podcast. So look for them. Until next time, this is Tom Vassell, and you've been listening to the Dice Tower. Thanks for joining us today. Stop by next week for episode 117, in which we talk about our top 10 game artists. We'd like to thank Your Move Games for their sponsorship. Check out www.yourmovegames.com to find out why Battleground Fantasy Warfare made Tom's top 10 games of all time, or join in the discussion on their forums. Until next week, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been listening to the Dice Tower.